Well, hi everyone. Lovely to see you here. So we are going to be wrapping up tonight our, I guess, mini series or series on uh, abiding, a life rooted in Christ. And just thinking about what we had talked about last time and even just looking more into it, it's just, it's such an important thing, uh, a mindset that we should have because without Christ, it's, it's hard, it's difficult. Um, but being rooted in Him, there is so much more joy and peace in your life. Um, so I just, before we really jump into it, we'll take some time to pray and, and then we'll get started. So let's go ahead and bow for some silent prayer. Most gracious Father, thank you so much for tonight, for just the message that your word brings, that for us to abide in you. And we know that as we abide in you, you abide in us. And um, Lord, it's, it's so easy to be distracted, to want to desire to go your own way, to do your own thing. But it does, it takes discipline to, to follow you. And we know that the Christian walk is not an easy walk, but we're so thankful that you're there with us each step. So just guide us tonight and uh, guide us every day in our, our walks with you. We pray this all in Jesus name, amen. So just a reminder as far as what we have talked about, we did have our three points here, our overview. So we wanted to look at what the definition of abiding is or was. We'll definitely take a look at that again. What does it look like? And then tonight we'll finally get an answer. How do we abide during challenges? So thinking of this in our life, how do we abide during that? So again, looking at the definition we saw that it was this idea to accept or act in accordance with a rule, decision, or recommendation. And this idea to be, be able to tolerate someone or something. And finally, in regards to a feeling or a memory to continue without fading or being lost. So those are, that's the English definition but when we look in God's word, we see again, the word meno for abide. And there are a lot and a lot, a lot, a lot of definitions and sub definitions giving lots of different contexts for that. So being able to remain or abide. So in reference to a place, you can see tarry, sojourn, not to depart, continue to be present, to be held, or kept continually. We see in reference to time, abiding in time. So to continue to be, to not perish, to last, to endure. Do we, we see of persons, that's to survive or and live. And then finally, in reference to state or condition to remain as one, not to become another or different. I like that last definition here, to remain as one, not to become another or different. I think about what the word says that we are not supposed to be, we're supposed to be of the world, but not in the world. Or did I get that? I think I got that backwards. So we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. So we're supposed to abide as believers. We're not supposed to compromise. We're not taking the shape. Uh, as I remember uh, that is, uh, what pastor was sharing about the idea with those pumpkins or squashes that they take those shapes of those molds. We're not to take the shape of the world, but rather we are reflection. We stay that reflection uh, of Christ. And then uh, our second 
definition for a body is to wait for or await one. And so we see this long list again, remain, sojourn, tarry, be present, kept, held, continue, not perish, endure, survive, and wait. And we talked about what do those words have in common? And do um, you guys remember what you said? Or do you have ideas? What, what really binds all these words together? What theme might bind these together? The Christian walk, absolutely. Waiting, waiting right? And what goes along with waiting? Patience. Ooh. Not always the easiest thing. And I know we I've done a, a sermon on waiting, you know, patience in God's timing. I mean, that fits right along with abiding in him. Abiding with abiding in Christ, that means we are patient with what God has for us and and doing our Christian walk diligently. It's not easy, but God never said it was going to be easy, but he said he was going to be there with us. He'd be with us each step. So that's the definition there. We also looked at some other scripture, at some scriptures on really what does abiding look like. We looked in John chapter 15. This is the famous passage where Jesus is saying that he is the vine, we are the branches. Abide in me and I in you. We also looked at Galatians 5.22. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And we know this is important because as we abide in Christ, we are examples. We are producing that fruit, the love, the joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So that's important, but we didn't really get a look at 1 John. So 1 John chapter 2, if you want to open your Bibles there, I will have it on the screen, but I'm going to open to it too. So 1 John chapter 2, this is what we see, the title here, uh, Christ our Advocate. And can what is an advocate again? Someone, we've talked about this definition before, but what is an advocate? I'm sorry, what? A mediator, okay. So somebody who's there to help. And Christ is our advocate. He's our advocate to the Father. So starting in verse 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, or not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. So right there in those three verses, we see that Christ is our advocate with the Father. He was the propitiation. He was the payment for our sins. And by this we know we have, to, we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. So that's, honestly, those three verses, that gives the gospel. We were sinners. Christ was our payment. He's our advocate. And how, what's the Christian walk? We keep his commandments. We obey him and do that. We'll continue on. Verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. 
So again, we see the compare and contrast of we know God, we're going to keep his commandments. If we say we know him, but we don't, that makes us a liar. And the truth is not in him. Yeesh, not, not fun. But we know that when we look in scripture, there's no real middle ground between you know, good and evil. If we aren't loving God, then we hate him. If we're not obeying him, we're disobeying. There's no middle ground. So same thing here. If we know God, we keep his commandments. If we don't know, if we say we know him, but we don't, we're foolish. We call, we're called a liar. So going back to verse 5 here, we see, By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walks. So we see abide here, that we are to abide in him. He who abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So how did Jesus walk his life? Perfectly. So what's, what's the expectation for us? Perfection, right? Are we ever going to meet perfection? No, sorry, pastor, not even you. You're close. But we know we're never going to meet perfection. But we're so thankful that we have Christ who did. So then we get to the new commandment. Beloved, I am writing to you, this is verse 7, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment, for I am writing to you which is true in him and you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. So we see earlier, keeping commandments. If we say we do and we aren't, we're a liar. Whoever says he is in the light but hates his brother, he's still in darkness. But we see here, in verse 10, whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. So when we look at the definition for abide in this context, it's that idea of to be held or kept continually. And when we love our brother, when our love for our brother uh, abides in the light, this isn't just a one-time uh, it's not a one-time transaction. This is something that is a lifelong um, abiding. So whoever loves his brother abides in the light. It's a, that continual holding on to as long as you live. And what's the reason for that? Well, we want to do that because there would be no cause for stumbling. We don't want our brothers or sister in Christ to stumble because of us and, and what we do. But we see here, abiding in the light, that helps cause no stumbling. So we see that here. Verse 11, but whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Not really easy to walk around in the dark. Have you guys ever been to like, uh, what's the cave that I'm thinking of? I don't remember. But have you guys been to like a cave before and you know, you start, Carlsbad Caverns, yes, exactly, that's what I was thinking of. Thank you. You go in there, and you start walking in, you start, you know, the light starts fading and fading and fading, and then it's dark. I'm sorry, Teresa, I know it's... No, I was just thinking I'm probably around in the maze here. <laughs> I'm pretty 
Well, that's, yeah, that's pretty dark too. But is it really easy to navigate around in the middle of the darkness where you can't even see your hand in front of your face? No, and so that's what this is compared to, that whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going. So abiding, we're in the light. If we're not abiding and hates his brother, we're in the darkness. John continues, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So in this context here, when we see how the word of God abides in you, this is equivalent to not to depart, not to leave, continue to be present. So this idea that something has established itself permanently within my soul and always it exerts its power in me. That's the word of God. That's Jesus in us, the Holy Spirit in us. Something has established itself permanently within my soul. When we accept Christ as our Savior, there is that permanent relationship with Christ. We can't lose that. And it exerts its power in me. That's the Holy Spirit teaching us, guiding us, telling us, hey, don't do that. Hey, you should be over here, not over here. Hey, do you think this is a good idea to walk in sin? No. I just, I love that definition that it's permanently within my soul. Just knowing that God's relationship that our relationship with God, there is nothing that can separate us. And we know that God has overcome the evil one. And we can too. If we live in Christ, if we are obedient to him, what power does Satan have over us? He can certainly tempt us. But he has no dominion over us. It's, we have to continue to be obedient and diligent and putting up those defenses so that we can continue to overcome the evil one. So the next section of scripture here, you see the title, Do Not Love the World. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Well, oh. do not love the world or the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Let that sink in. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So we see abide again. And this is the idea of, again, if we have that relationship with Jesus Christ, that the will of God abides forever. 
and it's the idea of him who becomes partaker of the true and everlasting life. So we have that true and everlasting life. And we know that God's will for us is not done until we meet him in heaven. God, always, he has a plan for us. He has a plan for each and every single one of us. We may not know what exactly it looks like, but being sensitive to how the Holy Spirit leads to how his word, what you read from his word with prayer, we know that God is always directing our paths. And so the will that he has for us, it abides forever. Then John gets into warning about Antichrist. He says, children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. So now many, many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. So in this, what would we say is Antichrist here in this context? We certainly know that there is Satan and the, an the Antichrist, but what would be something we could think of that's more relatable? Yeah, Kathy. Anything against Christ or any anything in spite, in place of Christ. So anything in place of Christ, okay. Yeah, James. So anyone who denies that Christ came in the flesh. So really what it comes down to, these are false teachers. These are people who are not speaking the truth. And this has been going on for, you know, a few thousand years, right? Going on for many, many years. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. We always know it's the last hour. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. But he could be coming back right now. He could be coming back tomorrow, next week, next year. Living our lives like this is the last hour. And so for us, what does that look like? Well, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. He's showing how they didn't follow along. They didn't get it. They didn't understand. But they went out, and it might become plain that they are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. There are zero lies in God's word. We can trust that 100% of the time. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Like James was saying, these antichrists, the people who deny that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Um, did I miss a word there? Uh, one moment, please. Nope, I was right. I just forgot a period, my bad. So again, we'll, we'll reread that verse. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So here we get to verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is a promise that he made to us eternal life. So if we look here at abiding, 
So let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son. So it's this idea that... Let me see if I, how I can explain it. We know that there are the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We are not the ones who generate that. Meaning we are not... We are not the creator of that. But we are filled... Or let's see. Let me, let me give my example here. So let's talk about joy. So... It's not the sense of this joy in me, i.e. of which I am the object, but the joy of which I am filled. So that idea of it's not my doing, it's how God uses joy and it fills me with joy. And I have that joy in who he is, in his truths, in his attributes, does that make sense? Kind of? It made more sense in my head, so. But we know that if we've heard the truth from the beginning, and that abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and the Father. You're going to continue to walk in a way that is in obedience to Jesus and the Father. And this is the promise. What's the promise? Eternal life. How great is that? I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. So the anointing that you received... Again, this is that idea. You have become a partaker of the true and everlasting life. The truth of the gospel is anointed, is poured over you. You have no need that any should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it is as taught you, abide in him. So there's where we see that we, we need to abide in Him. We need to abide in Christ. So f our final section here, I want to hear a little bit more from you guys. How do we abide during those challenges, those, those hardships in our lives? How, does, how do we do that. Pray. Absolutely. Yeah, Don? Claim promises that we've been given. Could you say that one more time? Claim promises. Claim promises that we've been given. Absolutely. Praise him in the middle of the challenges. Yeah, praise him in the middle of the challenges. That's not, that's like the opposite of what we want to do, right? We want to run and hide, but we were supposed to praise him. Marsha? Yeah, that's the only place, the challenges, they, they drive us to Christ, right? They should be driving us to Christ. I know it's, go ahead, Val. Spending time in his word, meditating on his word, right? It's so much easier for us if we're, having, we're in those difficult seasons of our life where we're actively going to God, praying, reading his word, meditating, you know, even seeking counsel from a good, uh, you know, from someone godly. That makes it so much easier. It takes that burden off our shoulders. And we can, like 
the fruit of the Spirit, we can have peace because we know that God's in control. He's, he's going to take care of us versus if we try and do it on our own strength. Man, I fall into that so many times where there's a situation, there's a problem. I'll take it, for example, like with work. Like sometimes I have to cover my other coworkers and, you know, I've got my own responsibilities, my own people that I talk to, emails, phone calls that I have to take care of myself. And then I'm doing that for them as well. But my mindset is, well, I want to make sure I can take care of it all myself. So I do that, and then I start getting behind on my emails, and then I miss a phone call, which sometimes that happens, you know, I'm on the phone with other people, but then I call back people, you know, an hour later than I should have, and I get an email back an hour later than I should have, and pretty soon I'm frustrated and I just want to, you know, take a break and just not have to work the rest of the day. Versus, my manager always says, hey, if you need help on anything, feel free to reach out. You know, I can reach out to my team. There's people in there who are happy to, you know, take a few items off my plate. And when I do that, what do you know? I can manage. Things are okay. So rather than us trying to take on that burden and face this challenge headstrong and say, okay, I've got this, this is really tough, but I know I can do it, we got to give it to God. We got to let go of those reins, those ropes, put our hands up and say, God, I need your help. I know that you are bigger than this struggle that I'm going through, but I need your help. And then you go to, your, go to his word, you pray, you call somebody, you reach out for good counsel. And what happens? That burden is lifted off from you. And there's, there's that freedom, there's that peace. You can have joy, you know, what it says. We're supposed to have joy in all circumstance. Joy is not dictated on how we feel, but it's our mindset. And same thing with abiding in Christ. It's not something that we do when life is good, when God is blessing us. We abide in him no matter what. So thank you for your answers on that. That was great. So we'll, we'll wrap up with just these three takeaways because, again, this is, it's a lifelong journey. We know that God's plan, again, does not stop until we meet him. And for us to abide in him, this is what I think we should be doing. Well, he wants obedience. We need to be obeying God. Be praying, be in his word, doing what he asks, keep his commandments. We also see that abiding in God, it takes sacrifice. It's not going to always be easy. God, like I said, God never promised us an easy journey, but he promised us a journey that he's going to be with us each step of the way. And finally, we have to rely on his strength. We can't do it on our own. We can get so far, and then we'll fall flat on our face. But thank the Lord that he's there with his hand, reaching down and say, come on, son, come on, daughter. I've got you. He's got that strength. He has what... He, need, he has what we need. And with that, we can truly be rooted in Christ. Let's close. Father, man, what a, what a just amazing 
amazing God you are. You show us love. You give us grace and mercy each and every day. Lord, you're there for us even when we walk as far away from you as we can. Your love doesn't change, it's, it's, it's static. And thank you so much for that. I just pray tonight, that as we hear these words, as we reflect, as we think about abiding in you, that we can be those branches, that we can produce the fruit, that we're obedient to your commandments, we're obedient to your word, Lord, we know it's not about us. It's not about how we look. It's about how you get the glory. And I just pray that we can be those vessels, that we can be those branches for you. Dismiss us with your blessing, and we just thank you for uh, this evening. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.